if we haven't met, my name is Innocent. Uh, myself and my family, we do church here. And we love coming here. Praise the Lord. And it's an honor this morning to be at the 11 o'clock service. It's my first one preaching at the 11 o'clock service. So I'm quite honored and privileged, and I thank God so much for that. I'm going to be sharing a message from the book of Acts. Um, before I, we open the verse that we're going to share on, I remember one time in my life where I had a down or a downturn in my life where things went down for me. I had gone to pick up my wife from work, and as we were coming back from, from that place, I got a call from Zimbabwe. I was in England that time. And for most of us who have come away from home, our normal place of where we were born, when you get a call, it always means two things. Something good is happening or something terrible has happened. Unfortunately, this time, something terrible had happened. I heard the message on the phone saying my father had passed away. That was really tough for me. That was really, I honored that man, I loved that man, and I would have loved to be with him at that time when he went, but I couldn't. Last year, around July, I had another call. We had come from church on a Sunday. It was on the 20th, I still remember. And again, this call was bad news. I lost a nephew of mine, my sister's son. And my sister raised me, so we were like brothers, though he was a nephew. And they told me that he had passed away in an accident. He didn't fall sick, so we were not prepared. It was quite a shock. I went in my bedroom and shut myself and just wept and cried out. Have you met disappointment in life? Have you been through situations that have knocked you down so much? Issues of life that have knocked you down? And how do we come back from those places? From those times when we are knocked down? From those times when things are not going so smoothly? How do we come back? I'm going to share a portion in Acts chapter 7. It's a sermon, probably the only sermon, by this guy called Stephen. Because after this sermon, they stoned him and he died. Bible says in Acts 6, Stephen was full of faith. He was full of power. He was full of the grace of God. In chapter 7, he gave a good oration of the Old Testament. And after sharing that, they took up some stones and stoned him. We want to meet with him as he's sharing his message on verse 17 of chapter 7. It says, as the time drew near when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. But then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king exploited our people and oppressed them, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. Verse 20 says, At that time, Moses was born, a beautiful child in God's eyes. Some Bible version says he was no ordinary child. His parents cared for him at home for three months. At the, as the time drew near for the promises of God to be fulfilled, 
the children of Israel who were captive in Egypt at that particular time, they increased in number. And that's a good thing. They increased probably ready for the fulfillment of what God had for them. But the Bible brings another verse there, according to Stephen, that during that time, there arose another king in Egypt. Who knew not Joseph? Those of us who remember the story, there was a Joseph who went there, and he was favored, and he brought the children of Israel, and they were given a land called Goshen, where they lived and planted. But a king arose who knew not Joseph. And he started oppressing the children of Israel. And they were crying. And he had said that he wanted all the firstborn or the baby boys to be killed. Every time a parent had a child, if it was a boy, they had to throw him on the Nile so that he would be eaten by crocodiles. The parents of Moses tried to keep him hiding for three months until they could no longer hide him anymore. They put him in a basket, waterproof, and put him on the Nile. To cut the long story short, he was adopted by the king's daughter. And the king's daughter didn't realize that this was probably a Jew. She knew probably because she said it might be a child from one of these Jews. But she brought him home and not told the king. So Moses grew up in Egypt in the palace. As an Egyptian, he was trained in the best education in Egypt. He ate the best of all foods in Egypt. He was trained on how they fight in wars in Egypt. He was like a prince in Egypt. As he moved around, people would honor him. People would feel that he is so important. And I believe he felt he was so significant himself as he moved around in Egypt. But the Bible says, on verse 23, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, his own people, the Israelites. I would want to think that as he was approaching his 40 years, somehow he knew he was not an Egyptian. I don't know how he knew Maybe somebody came and told him that you were thrown out onto the Nile. Or maybe the princess maybe told him that I picked you up from the Nile. You are probably a child from one of the Israelites. But it says he went to visit them. At this particular time, there were slaves in Egypt. As he visited them, he saw one of the Jews fighting or quarreling with an Egyptian. And something in him says, well, you know what? I've been trained in Egypt. I know how to use my hands. And he killed the Egyptian, defending the Israelite. He went home. I'm sure he felt good. And I don't think he told anyone. He just killed that person and probably hid the body somewhere. He comes back again to visit. But this time he finds two people quarreling or fighting. But it wasn't an Egyptian and an Israelite this time. It was both Israelites or Jews quarreling. And he says, you know, I've got wisdom. I've been trained in the best of all education. He said, brothers, you are brothers. Come on, guys. Don't fight among yourself. Don't quarrel. You are both Jews. Don't let this thing destroy you. Don't let this thing separate you. But one of the guys said, you, you want to kill me like you did the Egyptian? Who made you a judge between us? And it says when he heard those words, he was so afraid. He knew when they had gone round that he had murdered somebody. He probably knew he was going to be in trouble. He ran away to a place called Midian. He moved away from the palace to a place called Midian. I want you to come with me to Midian. The guy had come away from Egypt. 
where he was an important person. The come, guy has come out of Egypt where he was significant, where he ate the choice food. He slept in a nice place, but he ran away to a place called Midian. I want to think he had a bit of time to search his soul when he went to Midian. It was a soul-searching time. He didn't live in Midian for one day. It wasn't three days. It wasn't one week. It wasn't three years. But it was 40 years away from the palace, away from significance, away from what people knew him as, as a prince. He went to a place of obscurity where no one knew him. The Bible tells us that he started making a living looking after sheep as a shepherd. And the people of Midian were a nomadic type of people who moved from place to place because of their, their lifestyle and animals. They had to move and look for greener pastures for their animals. So coming from a life in the palace, he came to a life whereby he had no place that he called his own place. Started moving from one place to the other. A nomadic way of life. If I was Moses in today's language, I would probably be asking myself a lot of questions. God, why did I waste all those years learning the education system in Egypt? Why did I waste all those years, my God, be, be, being a prince or living under those conditions? And God, I even went to try and help your people to bring them together so that they don't fight among each other. Why, where have I missed it? I don't know whether you've come to a point in your life where things go round the wrong way that you start asking yourself questions. Where did I go wrong? How did things end up the way they are? Did I waste all my years doing what I was doing and yet it came to nothing? I believe Midian, on one hand for Moses, it was a soul-searching time. A place where he was remembering how he was rejected by his own brothers. A place where he was in despair. A place where he was in pain. There is a pain that may come and you have hope that it's going to go away tomorrow. But there is a pain that might come for 40 years. 40 years reminding you that you are a failure, you, you are a nobody, you are damaged goods. 40 years. I know a bit how he felt because of the language he used at the end of the 40 years when God comes back to him. Because God comes to him and said, I'm sending you back. You know, the first thing he said to God after 40 years, he said, I'm not the right person. To me, that's an answer of somebody that has been knocked down by life. Somebody that had a bad time rough time in life that you don't want anyone else to come in and try or encourage you to do things differently. He says to God, I'm not good. I'm the wrong person, God. Find somebody else to send to that place. Don't you remember, God, how they rejected me? Don't you remember, God, that I'm now a nobody in this land? I don't even have a place of my own. We are moving from one place to the other. Don't you remember the pain that I endured? Don't you remember the tears I had all night? Don't you remember the hurt, the bitterness, the unforgiveness that I hold on to? He says, I'm not the right person. And he even says to God, God says, I'm still sending you back. He says, God, I don't have any authority. God says, yeah, but I'm sending you back. He says, God, they will not listen to me. They will say, can we listen to that guy? Do you remember him? He killed the Egyptian. Do you remember him? He's a failure. Where was he all these 40 years? We won't listen to him. But God comes to him in Midian and says, I'm going to send you back. So Midian can be a place of soul searching. 
Maybe you are in median right now. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody who is in median, a place of soul searching. Things have gone wrong in your life. Things are not right as we speak. You are wondering how you came to be where you are now. You are wan wondering where you missed it. Where did things go wrong? But things can be different depending on how you look at things. Because when we first read, the Bible says it was a time whereby the fulfillment of the promises of God were about to happen. But at the same time, it was a time whereby another king was persecuting them. You could look at the time that Moses was born from different angles. I might say Moses was born at a time whereby the king who was there was so rude and cruel, he was killing people. But I might look at it from a different angle. He was born at a time whereby God was about to fulfill stuff. When you look at things that way, you won't care much of how things are happening around you. Because you are seeing God fulfilling things in your life at that particular time. If I show you, I've got a bottle of water here. It's not full. I've drank a bit of it. If I was to ask some of you how you describe the water in that bottle, I might get roughly two answers or maybe three for some of you. But one of the answers I would get is that that bottle is three quarters empty. Of a quarter empty, rather, is it? <laughs> Let's call it half so that I don't do the maths. <laughs> I say it's half empty. And another person would look at the same bottle and say the bottle is half full. The one who is looking from the empty point of view sees things differently. Because the empty point of view is looking at things going further down until it gets finished. But the one who is looking at half full, I'm looking at it from the other side. If I put a bit more water, it might get filled up. If I put more water, it might get full again. So it's all about the perspective, how you look at things. Moses was looking, maybe doing soul searching in Midian. But I want to bring it to you that Midian probably could have been a place of growth as well for Moses. A place of preparation for Moses. I know he was prepared during those 40 years because the Bible later described him as the most humble person on earth. How did he learn humility? 40 years of brokenness, 40 years of hard life, 40 years of things going wrong. He learned brokenness. I don't think he was broken the first 40 years when he was a prince because he felt he could solve things. I can kill an Egyptian. I can solve things for you. I live in a palace. But God brought him out to deal with him. That place where people could be crying, soul searching, could be a nice place of being one-to-one -one with God. Meeting up with God and allowing God to deal with you and change things in your life. Let me just say, could it be that the median you are complaining or crying about, maybe it's the place that God is just stretching you a bit so that he gets you ready to go back. He gets you prepared to go back. We learn or grow during hard times. Our faith grows when we use it. We learn ability through inability. And we realize our dependence on God. Whilst he was in that place, he had a light bulb moment or a burning bush moment. Looking after the sheep, he sees a burning bush, but it wasn't consumed. And he went near to see what was happening. In those times, at times God comes in and brings a light bulb moment. Whilst I'm in despair, whilst I'm in discouragement, in depression, God just comes and just start enlightening you regarding the way you're looking at things. So after the 40 years, God comes and says, I'm sending you back to Egypt now as a deliverer. When I was down in home in, at our village, 
Every time before we planted crops, we had to take some waste, animal waste, and put it a bit in the fields. So we dig it up and put it in the fields. When you put the animal waste, the manure, the dung, it doesn't smell nice. At times we have to avoid the road going through that place because it smells so bad. But why do people endure the bad smell? Because they know that that manure is releasing some nutrients into the soil and prepare it for a good, good harvest. My mom always used to say, we're going to have a good harvest this year. Before we even planted. Why? She knew that that smelly stuff that she has put in the soil is going to work some magic so that the soil can bring something good, a good harvest for us in the end. Could it be the smelly stuff in your life? Could it be just manure? Could it be just something that is just mixing it up? So that by the time you stand, by the time you come up here, by the time you come back, you are in better shape. You are in better shape for battle. It's only manure. Joel Austin calls it fertilizer. He said some of our tears is just fertilizer. He said some of our pains is just fertilizer. It's not nice now, but it's going to be nice later. Pastor McManus says... Your freedom is on the other side of your fear. Your greatness is on the other side of your pain. Your future is on the other side of your failure. The way you started does not have to be the way you end. And this is what I'm bringing to you today. That the way you are is not the way you will end. But what you are going through, the other side of it, it's going to be great for you. I'll just call the band to come back, and I might ask you to just stand on your feet before we pray. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's just stand on our feet. I want to encourage somebody this morning that God is calling you from where you are. And some of us, maybe we have been in Midian for so long that we are stuck. We are seeing no way out. And you're saying, you don't know me. I've been here 40 years. That's your median. There is no way out. Things are stuck for you. But God came back for Moses. And I like verse 35 of chapter 7, what it says. The same Moses. The Bible says God came. And it's the same Moses who they rejected in the first place. That's the same person that God is sending back. The same Moses. The same person who was rejected. The same person who had pain issues in his life. The same person who had disappointments. Who had a bit of soul searching. The same Moses. The same person. God comes and says, get ready. We're going back. Get ready. You're coming out of Midian. We need to go back to Egypt. You are the deliverer that they've been waiting for. And that's the message I'm bringing to you today. Get ready, brother. Get ready, my mom, my brother, my father. Just get ready. You're coming out of Midian because God wants to send you back. The smelly stuff, the fertilizer that you've endured for all this time. God is saying it's time now. Come out. The same you. But God would have transformed you. Made you ready for the battle ahead of you. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Your past shouldn't be your place of residence. It's just a place of reference that I've been there. But that's not where you live. Do not count yourself out. God is saying, I'm changing your perspective. Let's close our eyes. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Let's just close our eyes. I'm just giving this a bit of moment for privacy for people whom we want to pray for. The first group I might want us to pray for to this morning, you are saying you are so far away from God. God 
is moved, you have moved away from the presence of God or from His grace. It could be due to situations of life. You have been pounded hard by life and you have moved away from God. You have even grown bitter with God. God is saying He loves you. His hands are still stretched out to receive you. And I want to give you this opportunity to come back to God, to come back to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I've moved far away from you. I'm moving from one place to the other. I'm so unstable, but I need you in my life. He is ready to have you this morning. He is ready to accept you back and send you back this morning. If you're there, you're saying innocent. Before we close, please pray with me. I want to receive Jesus. I want to come back to God. I want him to be my Lord. I want to give you this opportunity. I want you to raise your hand high where you are standing as we speak. I can see a hand standing up already. Just raise your hand high wherever you are and we're going to pray with you. I can see a hand at the back there. Bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? We thank God. Praise God. I can see some hands. Praise God. We're going to pray. Just keep your hand up. Don't be shamed. Just leave your hand up in there. But we're going to pray together with you. I want the whole church to support these people who are raising their hands. And we want to pray this prayer together with them. Raise your hand and say, Lord Jesus. Can you say this after me, all of us, as we support the brethren coming back to God? Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my life. I had moved away from you. But thank you, God, that you love me. I'm coming back to the cross. I'm coming back to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your child. In Jesus' name. Amen. Whilst we're still praying, maybe you are here as well. You have been coming to church. You identify yourself as a believer. But as I speak, you know that you are stuck in a place called median of your life. A place of bitterness. A place of unforgiveness. A place where you are stuck because of life issues around you. Painful issues around you. The same Moses, God came to him. That same Moses, God can come to you. He doesn't condemn you. You are not a failure. That's not your identity. God was just preparing you. He's just preparing you for your next level. If you are here and you are just saying, I just need prayer. I have issues in my life. I just need somebody to stand with me in prayer. I'm going to give you this opportunity as well. As we sing, I want you to come up here and we've got a prayer team right up here who will just minister to you. If you are there, don't go out if you need prayer. If you feel you need somebody to stand with you, things are not right, things are, don't know, I don't know how things are, but I want you to come up here and we will pray with you. Bless you. Thank you, guys.